everybody, and welcome back to the Weird Science Marvel Comics Podcast. This is episode 424, and it is the midweek show where I'm going to be joined by my man Gabe, who is going to talk a little Ant-Man number one with me because he ended up reviewing it on the site today as well. And before we go into this week's show, though, I will tell you a couple things. We're going to change up a bit of the scheduling on the whole deal. We're adding a couple of podcasts, adding some things. So I think that it would be best to maybe shuffle some things around, have things kind of lay out in a better format. If you notice, we have the Weird Dose of X, the X-Men podcast comes out on Tuesday. That will still be Tuesday. Then on Wednesday into Thursday, we will have this midweek show, just a regular show, probably going through one, two, maybe three books at the most, but usually just a couple books. They aren't even necessarily books that came out that day. They might be things that we didn't get to uh, before, but it's just kind of a looser show. It's a loosey goosey thing where I'll be talking about some things. Maybe I'll be joined by Gabe for most of it. We'll see. And then sometimes we'll have news, maybe have some things like that. But that will be, as I said, Monday into Thursday morning where you'll have that. Then I'm going to shift the Star Wars show from Sunday to Friday. We end up recording it Friday anyway. But what that then leaves is our main Marvel podcast with me and Jason. That'll be out Sunday night. That'll give people a chance to catch up with the books, get everything that we're talking about and everybody will be ready to go with that and it kind of lines up with our dc comics podcast that comes out on sunday as well so really that's just a switcheroo with the star wars in the main podcast it'll make sense once we get going trying to you know get some more shows and maybe you know spark a little interest going on with everything that marvel is doing and maybe even the shows themselves might be a little tiny bit different, but probably not. It'll probably be the same old, same old with those. But hopefully we'll get some good books so we can talk about all that. But I will tell you, I was joined by Gabe today. We ended up talking about Ant-Man. And since it was the first time we'd ever talked or recorded together, sometimes that leads to snafus. I know I've been talking a lot about having snafus on this with the recording process that I use. This was probably more my fault for not checking it, but everything sounded fine. Ended up recording it, and it was a disaster, but I didn't want to ditch it. So I spent hours trying to make this work, make it, uh, you know, kind of fixed. But you'll notice that Gabe's audio might be a little off at times. Please forgive me for that. We'll work this out, and we'll get it all right. And a lickety split. But we're going to go right now, and I'm not even going to go through all the stuff of what you could go to and all that. We'll just get right to it. It's me and Gabe talking about Ant-Man, which we really did like and talk a little longer than I was planning on it. But again, I want this to be a little more loose on the midweek deal. So here we go off to talk Ant-Man number one. All right. And I am here with a special guest, the special guest that I hinted oh at last week. It is Gabe. What up, Gabe? Hey, what up, Jim? Thank hey, you for having what me on. Up? No problem. And yeah, you said that you heard that you got all like, am I the special guest? I'm like, no, there, you are. There weren't any other special guests. And as I say, and probably said at the beginning of this podcast as well, again, when I mentioned the Marvel site, I always say you can go and read some reviews, some by Gabe. No, they're all by Gabe. Gabe does all the reviews <laughs> on the Marvel site. So it makes sense to be on this midweek podcast. And I said we were I was figuring out what we were going to do for this and have you on for the first time here. And I figured right, obviously right. we're going to do something that you review. And I looked and, yeah. and this is what first popped out. Ant-Man number one. There were a couple other things and a couple other number ones. I think that this is the best one to start with because me and you both liked it. We thought that I, it's funny because before we started recording here, you said that it was cute. And I agreed. And it was funny. Sometimes you sit there and you read an issue and you're like, Huh, what do I think of this? And then somebody will say a word, like or a phrase, and it, it clicks. And yeah, yeah, this is cute. This is this is a nice, cute little comic. I don't know exactly what's going on at the beginning or the end. We're gonna have to find out. But even as you'll explain, it's something they're playing with. Al Ewing is having fun with this. And since you're on for the first time, I don't know if you are a big fan of Al Ewing or if you're not or whatnot, but uh, what do you think of old Al Ewing? I, I think Al Ewing is a, a very capable writer. 
uh, I, I don't really, ha- I've never really had a direct interaction with him, so I, I don't know if he's blocked me or I, I certainly have never I was blocked him. Say, or is it that like he that. blocked you or? <laughs> well, wait, let me, you know, let me take a peek. Let me take a peek. Yes, yeah, as you say that, oh, you, I will as tell I say you, that. he blocked me because I asked him why he blocked Eric. That and then block me. That's all it took. I didn't get blocked by a blockchain by him. I just said, "Hey, why do you block people that have never interacted with you?" When they go to see what you're up to, they find out they're blocked, and that doesn't sound good. And then he basically told me to go pound sand and block me. And I well, thought it's confirmed. Crazy. I I am not blocked by. Okay, Al you're not. Well, that's cool. Well, maybe then you can uh, tweet him about this podcast because I cannot. Uh, I'm blocked by all the greats. Uh, but at least you have that. And so you, you like Al Ewing enough and I like him enough. I just sometimes I think that he needs a little bit more editorial control when he gets a little over the top. And when things get cosmic, which he loves to do, I think that they go a little beyond my scope of things. They start to get very wordy, narration heavy and very, you know, not of the mind, but he likes to be, you know, intellectual and stuff like that. Like the immortal Hulk, everybody loves. Uh, I found it good at first and I got a little bored. Then I was back on it. It went kind of like dribs and drabs with me or like a roller coaster ride of emotions that by the end, I think it was a good series overall, but there were points where it was losing me big time, but then it would pull me back. It's like the mob it was, but uh, issue number 25 of the immortal Hulk was one of my least favorite issues I've ever read of a comic. And so he has that like, back and forth with me but i do like him so i hope that you're going to convince me to love him to love him so much not that you said it's your favorite writer or anything. That's, 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 a, that's a tall order <laughs> yeah and i'm with you immortal hulk had some ups and downs some more ups than downs yeah, i think yeah. just as a whole i remember the, the the thing that i was reading from him previous to that i think was guardians of the galaxy mm-hmm. and i i was lost yeah i, I was like i picked it up midway through and that thing was so cosmically all over the place i didn't know what was going mm-hmm. on yeah so and, it sort of depends on the property that he's on i think that makes a big difference in how well it comes across i agree and uh again i think that sometimes his concepts are great but sometimes the execution is a little down or it gets a little long in the tooth and the immortal hulk i thought the the whole concept was awesome and like you said, more ups than downs with it. That's going to be the series that he's going to be known for, for pretty much the the big deal, even though he has a bunch of other things already. But that's the big one. But especially remember when at one point people were going nuts because finally the Hulk was out selling Batman at a point and people were losing their minds. So, yeah, it, it was good. But here we are with Ant-Man number one. And. I was wondering, like, well, what is this going to be about? What is this going to do? What is this going to be? And he does get a little bit of, you know, fancy. It's a little bit, but in the story itself, it's actually very fun and very cute, like you said. And it, it harkens back to the Silver Age and really plays it up well. That I, I actually think if you took and took some of the little things out of it and then just gave it to somebody, you'd say, oh, man, this is an issue that came out in 1967. I don't think anybody would know any different. I think they'd be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I never saw this one before, right? It's it's a seamless blend. Uh, this is this is this first issue is part of a four part mini. Uh, you know what? Why don't I just read the solicit the, the credits so we can jump right into it? Uh, this is uh, according to <laughs> the solicit is Ant Man number one from Al Ewing. Flashback to the early days of Hank Pym's career as the astonishing Ant Man. It's date night for Hank and his girlfriend Janet Van Dyne, but, but nobody told that to Ant Man's enemies. Watch as Hank's antagonists, and in quotation marks, band together to finally take down the scientific adventurer. But will anyone come to his rescue? And who is the mysterious stranger who stalks them? This is Ant-Man number one, written by Al Ewing, art by Tom Riley, who most recently you might have might recognize from the uh, Thing mini, the The Thing miniseries from, uh, I believe, late last year, early into this year. Colors by Jordi Belair, lettering by VC's Corey Petit, and the main cover cover raised by, also by Tom Riley. Yeah, and and we do start out with that mysterious guy in the future. And it is kind of that thing where you jump in and and that really throws you off. It's a very cold open. You don't know what's going on. But as you pointed out to me before we started, it plays with that. It actually plays with that in a kind of a clever little comic booky way, scientific way, because it looks like this guy is doing something like, what can you say? It looks like he's doing some experiments. It looks like he's, 
checking out and trying to figure out what Ant-Man is through a VR type program that looks like it's called Marvel. And you even have that little wink wink of, you know, hey, this guy is important, but we don't want to have spoilers and things like that. But that's part of the actual thing going on. Uh, and you, you, like you said, I, you pointed out to me and I thought, yeah, that, that's pretty fun. That, that's pretty clever. It's pretty cute. Um, right off the bat, you're starting off in the, in the far future, which is about 525 years, I guess, in the future in 99 AU, which is somewhere well outside of the universe. The art style in the prologue is very different from the main book. So you're really, you're getting sort of a futuristic, very kind of weird, odd, futuristic style. The, the narration, as soon as I saw the narration for the, in the caption boxes, I saw that sort of stilted technical uh, way of speaking that reminded me of Machine from the Eternals book. So I was like, oh boy, are, are we are we are we trying to t- tie into the Eternals? It turns out not. I, I think it, I think it's just the AI that uh, whoever this main bearded character is working with uh, just happens to have a, a, a computer that uh, that's narrating for him as it follows whatever adventure or task or challenge or threat he's trying to deal with. But the art is very sort of uh, modern, weird, new tech type style, but it's different from the rest of the book, and you see that transition almost immediately as soon as, as soon as we drop in. And you're right, it does sound and feel a lot like the machine and and that and that is that could get scary for some people but like you said once you get to the credits page the next deal and you have the astonishing ant-man and the wonderful wasp it just looks classic it looks silver age classic deal uh even the way that you have the panel layout and the page behind it looks like it's a little bit aged it looks like this is something that would be have sat around for a bit and you pulled it out to read it and i think that that's a really cool play but yeah, Tom Riley's art goes so well with this. I said to you that I think it, it reminds me of a feel of the grand design books mm-hmm. with the X-Men and even that Fantastic Four for the lesser deal. I always think about the X-Men one by Ed Pisker, and it feels like that, like you are reading an actual history or an actual issue of the comic, but it's it's a new story. And then you start to mold and meld things in because in the credits page, classic deal with all the villains that we're going to see already yep. there i think that that's really fun you have a little bit of a narration and see the deal and if you are paying attention you're like why does that one like tough guy from like 1930s look like he has a spray bottle but we'll we'll find out we will we'll find, find out. out it's kind of funny and even then you have a trumpet a spray bottle like man these are great villains but kind of playing with the idea of what an ant-man villain is and kind of the goofiness of that uh, but when they go off and you have a date night, as it said in the solicit with Hank and Janet, and they're going to the movies to see the Submariner versus the Fantastic Four and even kind of playing around with the idea of a little wink, wink joke of like the Marvel, you know, cinematic universe type deal. But in this where this is a movie that uh, Submariner Namor has actually done a bit of the money, the producing of it, and he has some footage from it and they're throwing it together. Uh, But Janet's excited because she thinks this is finally a date night and we're going out. But Hank reveals that he's actually there, maybe looking at almost like game film here in case he ends up, you know, facing them or, or, you know, going along with the Fantastic Four, which I thought was pretty fun. Well, Hank Pym is is one of the consummate scientists of the Marvel Universe, very much like Reed Richards or Dr. Dr. Doom or anybody else is whenever there's an opportunity to gather information and data that he could use later he won't pass it up so even though he's on a date night and i can i'm, I'm married so are you uh yeah if, if you're on a date night and your mind is on something else your 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 significant other is going to pick up on that and boy oh boy uh and, and it was fun especially because there's a lot of namor news that came out in the past couple of weeks because of the, the black panther um Honda forever trailer and then you get your first look at mcu version of namor so it's kind of nice timing to see those tying together but yeah as soon as you transition from that prologue into the into the main part of the book that that art style from riley just worked perfectly and and i even said in the in the review you gotta get a lot of credit to jordy belair on the coloring because he picked up all the right you know using the the color smudges that sort of look like watercolors a little suggestion of uh, bende dots which is those newsprint dots that they used to use to give color shading on a newspaper print this just looks perfect. If you're looking for a, a Silver Age or kind of an homage type comic, you could not tell the difference. They even weathered the they even weather the borders to make it look like an older newspaper. Yep. I mean, yeah. it's and perfect. That's really good, and that shows you how much care they put into it. Now you mentioned it too. 
The scientist at the beginning does remind me a bit of Reed Richards, too. I was going to say that at one point, but definitely does. Uh, but you have in this where Hank, he starts getting hit by popcorn by a kid behind him. And the funny thing here is I'm waiting to see and hoping that Hank doesn't get that temper going because of all the bad things that he's done in the past. And he kind of does. But the funny thing is this kid reveals himself as he's throwing popcorn. And really, what a jerk. I mean, even if it's a kid or whatever, this kid, over the top, but it's Eric O'Grady who ends up becoming the irredeemable Ant-Man later. So that's kind of the weird play in this. I'm like, I'm not here like an Eric Shea continuity kid. I'm not, you know, well, he's not that age there or whatever. I think it's kind of fun. And I think that melding of the things makes it like a wink, wink. And there are some Easter eggs in here that are pretty funny. But boy, he is a jerk. I mean, he is irredeemable here. Just throwing at one point looks like a, I don't know, a whole tub of popcorn on Hank. And Hank's pissed. And Janet says, just calm down. You know, watch the movie. Don't get a, you're getting upset about a kid. And he, he gets mad because it is true. Janet has not one popcorn kernel hitting her. But he gets up to go. And, and it's funny, too, because here's the villain of the first deal here, a kid throwing popcorn, and he can't take it. He goes up. He's like, yeah, I got to excuse me. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go out here. And he runs out as Eric decides, well, I ran out of popcorn. I got to go fill up uh, because I want to hit this guy. Now, seriously, I know this is you know of the back in the day feel. Nowadays, how much would that popcorn cost? That is not a bucket that's a barrel there's got to that thing has to be a 30 dollars thing of popcorn nowadays it's so over the top i mean really and uh but yeah did you like that there was eric there it was kind of a weird play i, I like to eric o'grady there this is one of this is one of those scenes where you have to walk the bouncing act and i think you yeah. did it well because there is so much history behind hank Pym. Uh, Beyond this point in history, I was half expecting him to stand up and give Eric O'Grady a backhand <laughs> in the face. Because <laughs> Hank, all the Hank Pym, he's got a temper on him. So yeah, I was expecting some really bad things to happen. And and you're right, looking at the size of the popcorn, it was translated into modern movie theater going Thank experience. So it would be it would be a choice between that bucket of popcorn or my date. Yeah, because I couldn't or, afford or a car. Both. You said about Eric getting hit. I'm sitting there and Janet starts really ripping in the hang. I'm like, Janet, you better back off. I mean, there's some bad things are going to happen here. Please stop. Yeah. Jenny, Jenny, you're going to learn very soon not to lip off to hang <laughs> him. Know, not please. in a good way. And not please in a good don't way. Do that. It's awful. Also with me, I wouldn't be very good as Eric here because when I go and get the refill of the popcorn, I would have so much butter. And that thing, it wouldn't really be a good projection. It would be very wet and, and just awful. Because, yeah, once they ended up having movie theaters where you could actually put your own popcorn out, or your own butter on the popcorn, I was done. My wife banned me from popcorn. I'm not allowed to do it because I put too much. Not even that I I say butter. I don't even know what that stuff is. It's it's like oily nonsense. But It's like when you get those American cheese packets and they say uh, cheese product. This is butter product. It's not actual butter. It's butter <laughs> exactly. product. It's like you're drinking milk. Wait, this is milk. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so Eric goes out and he, he's getting popcorn. And the funny thing is, is that Hank is full out on the job. He's Ant-Man in the plant watching this kid get popcorn so he can, you know, give him a lesson here, prove a lesson. So. This one scene confused me a little bit because when Eric O'Grady's sitting in the movie theater after he rows back, he looks like a punk kid, like maybe 14, 15. But when he goes into that uh, lobby to get some more popcorn and he starts hitting on the cashier, he looks like he's more like 17, 18. So I got a lot of, I got a weird, confusing age vibe from that, especially when she turns him down pretty hard. But he plays it through and then, uh, then we see that Hank Pym he, you know, he may not backhand Eric O'Grady, but he's going to get his he's going to get his pound of flesh one way or the other, and, and that's when the Ant Man suit comes out. Ant Man suit comes out. Yeah, and he ends up getting ants to go and go in the popcorn to upset yep. Eric. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, well, it does suck having ants in your popcorn, but you weren't going to eat it anyway. He was just going to throw it, but still, he ends yeah. up freaking out and drops it. And you know, Hank thinks that he has saved the day. Now, I love the idea that this is like the big play. Like Hank's like. Yep, I guess my work's done today. I stopped the kid from throwing popcorn at me. I am the Ant Man. And the ants though are in the lobby still of the the, the movie theater. And you do mm -hmm. see from the shadows somebody that is working. Okay, Ant Man, this is gonna be the time I'm gonna take you down. And you know, there we go. We're gonna start the real deal going. But then there is the big play where we see the scientists from that beginning who then just pops in 
And, you know, there's ants on the floor. He ends up using some sort of wave on them and says that, thanks a lot. You have now saved, you know, you've done a great service. You saved the future. You've done all this and walks off. And I guess he's just there to collect a specimen of ants. It looks like in my mind, right? Now, now this is the, yeah. And that's, this, for me, this is the most confusing part of the story. Because when this individual who is in the prologue, uh, who's coming from the distant future, very far, very far away, a long time ago, uh, comes back into time to this version of Ant-Man, he doesn't talk to it. And he doesn't, you know, hey, let me see how your helmet works or what did you do here, X, Y, Z. He collects the ants. And, and, and for, as far as I know, unless I've uh, misread something, Ant-Man always has the ability to call just regular ants. There's nothing special about them. He just sort of sends a communication signal. So I'm not quite sure why this future person needed to collect his ants, but I guess we'll see. I'll give you a little theory. A little, and it's funny, too, because if you look, He's like the Pied Piper then, because when he walks out, the ants are now following him in like a single file. My belief in this is that he is future Ant-Man. They kind of play this out in some of the solicits of that, at least. But he can't really be Ant-Man because in the future where he is, there are no ants. Ants are gone. Maybe the world is gone. And maybe that's a big thing. He had to come down. And maybe the big play here is they're already little friendly and you know they're the ant-man ants and they'll be gone and so he's taking them back with them to maybe use them in the future that hopefully we'd get in like an issue four but that's the only thing i could think of like you'd have an ant-man in a world that has no ants and you have to kind of do that is my only play maybe we'll see yeah we'll, and, we'll if see. I'm, and again if i'm reading that uh that uh, prologue correctly there are 99 au from earth which means they're well so he's definitely on another planet unless i'm misreading that so yeah he, he definitely could be on a planet where there are, are no ants the other thing you know, the other thing to take into account is in this version which is the, the original version of ant-man is he doesn't shrink and expand by pim particles he uses a shrink gas which is which is going way 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 back into the deep cut of the history so um yeah they get they get all they can to all kinds of weird chemical shenanigans like a it's not. It's it's weird and it's silly, but it's fun at the same time. When Janet does it, it's great because she just leaves what looks like she's trying to. It's almost like well, we'll get to it, but it, it looks like she's like a kid who ended up like going and sneaking out and leaving like clothes underneath the bed. But it's just it made me laugh when she does it. But before that, we end up where he gets attacked. Hank gets attacked. That guy he goes to follow, he disappears. He thinks that he shrunk. He's like, maybe he shrunk down. I just think he just teleported out. He ended up going out. And so in that, he gets attacked by the window washer. And I, I laugh because that's his name, because he's never been named. He's from a past issue, Tales to Astonish 41. And it was a guy who ended up being a window washer that was using a paralytic spray that he has here. But he was doing it for an alien overlord. And this whole thing ended up being a wacky adventure where freedom fighters ended up teaming up with Hank and stopping all this. And then this window washer guy, he ended up being in prison and they were going to try to reform him. That was all set up in that issue way back when he's back because he's convinced them he's reformed. And now he's back for revenge. And I thought, that's pretty fun that, you know, to go back and to play around with different villains and things like that and to really pick out this guy. This window washer seems like Al Ewing might have been reading some issues and thought, you know what? This is one of those wacky characters that deserves a little bit of a another appearance. Still don't name him, though. He is still just the window washer. And there you go. There's a villain now, the window washer, because before he was kind of a patsy type of guy. But I thought it was hilarious. And, and he ends up spraying Hank and paralyzing him. Hank's like, oh, my God, he got me with the window cleaning fluid. Oh, no, it's not. It's a paralytic thing. So Silver Age that it made me giggle. And then the guy even starts throwing shade, starts yelling at him, and, you know, pretty much starts to lead into this ant antagonist group that's going to go after him. But you go from there because you end up where he – Ends up leading them out, and then you get all the other villains, which these aren't the big name villains. Yeah, I mean, props to Al Ewing for. I mean, this isn't a deep cut. This is this is a decapitation. I mean, you go way way back and and finding a, a character that it's silly but wholesome. I think is, is the right word. And what you'll see is throughout the rest of the issue, all the villains that make up the antagonists, they're, they're, none of them really have super super duper powers. 
all their all their villainry comes from gadgets or chemicals or some kind of magic device. Without them, they're just regular Joes. I mean, to to use a vernacular. So it's kind of fun that Ant Man is probably realistically more powerful than any one of them, but combined, they have enough gadgetry and and weird gimmicks and uh, chemicals and all kinds of things to take them down. Uh, so in that sense, it, it, it's a more grounded story. But at the same time, it, it is kind of silly, but it's silly in a, hey, we're just having fun with it kind of way. And, and I really like that a lot. Yeah, there's no so, threat here that, you know, Janet at a point is going to be decapitated. There's no yeah, yeah, yeah. bad thing. It's very silver agey. So the idea of it is, oh, my God, I'm paralyzed by the spray at, at a point. Oh, my God, I'm having hallucinations because of a trumpet <laughs> or I'm going to be aged up by an age. Right. I mean, these are fun things. I always like that sort of thing anyway. And I agree that it's really good. Yeah, you know, these guys make more sense as like Batman sixty six type. It's films. very Batman sixty six. I was thinking right, of that right. as well. Like if they had Tracy. an Ant Man deal, I like that. Yeah, or Dick Tracy or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Where they're just regular guys with a little bit of a gimmick, and they just decide to use that gimmick for good, for evil rather than good. Yeah, and the evil yeah. again, the evil of the Time Master, because we get into a cab, you end up loading him up, and you end up seeing, oh no, there's Trago, the man with the magic trumpet. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> like now that, and then Time Master uh, Elias Wemus is the driver of the cab, and he's a guy who got old. He got sick and tired of people, and wasn't a bad guy at a point, but he got sick of people telling him he was old. So in his weird way, he said, "Okay, I'm going to make a device not to make me younger. That'd be too hard. I'm going to make a device make everybody old so that they can't make fun of me. We're all old, then. So yeah, very Batman sixty six s, and they take Hank back, and then. You end up seeing the main villain who's kind of gotten them together. It's Gerald Marsh, the protector. And then, yeah, we're just there and they just want to have revenge on Ant-Man. They want to take him down. They're sick of it. They want to get some tech, whatnot. And it's like you said, it's a fun, wholesome deal, whatever. Even if it is them, you know, grabbing a hero, whatever, it still is pretty wholesome with it. And, yeah, they're going to go through their deal, including, I'm telling you, when, when Trago gets out his uh, trumpet and he's about to play some tunes, I, I couldn't help giggle. It's just funny. And you do have a really cool panel of what that is and how it's going with this musical mayhem and causing hallucinations and distortions. But you end up having Hank, who is paralyzed. He's tied up. He needs to get out of this. So who is he going to call? Of course, he's going to call Janet. And you take it from there because you end up and I there's even the funny. I mean, I really thought it was funny with the ants that can't spell right. That right. was pretty good. <clears throat> right. So Hank uh, sends his ants to send out a distress call over to Janet, who's still patiently waiting in the movie theater. I don't know about you, but if my <laughs> if I would if I was gone that long, I mean, think about it. He went out. He dealt with O'Grady. Then he got then he met that strange guy from the future. Then he went out and he was captured by the window washer. They got in a cab ride. They went across town. They've chained him up. That that can't have happened quickly. That had to have taken at least an hour. So I don't know about you, but my wife would not have been sitting there for an hour wondering what happened to me just enjoying the movie. Uh, so, man, give give Janet some credit. Patience is all get out because there's no way my wife would have been uh, would have sat there for that long. Uh, she would have been so furious. Anyway, so the ants come in and they spell out the word help, but instead of help, it's help. So they get the, get the letter. I mean, they, you know, ants don't speak native English, so that's just how it goes. And she figures out something's wrong. And, and, and credit here because Janet doesn't look at this and then, and then go through that shtick of Halep. What are you trying to tell oh, me? I thought we were going to get there. Yeah, I thought we were going to get there, and I was like, please don't do that. Please don't treat her like an idiot. But she's like, okay, I get the, I get the point. You can't spell, but I know what you're trying to do here. Mm-hmm. So then she uses her own shrink gas and puts on her classic. Uh, uh, wasp outfit with, with the weird pointy hat and then uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of, it looks so it looks so very much like uh, something out of a weird schlocky like sci-fi, sci-fi movie. movie it does yeah, yeah like it aliens does. from Venus like exactly. you know Mars, Mars wants women it's one of those kinds of things uh, so she flies off and she tracks the ants uh, from their signal back to wherever Hank is being you know uh, um, held hostage in a uh, in an apartment by the ant agonists who are you know goofy guys. But who does she see coincidentally trying to break into that same apartment? It's a uh, it's a uh, Scott Lang. Yeah, Scott she, Lang is a second floor man. She says because yeah. he's breaking in. He's got the crowbar. The funny thing is, as he opens up this window, he does get Trago's trumpet going through, and it does kind of get him. 
And he's like, oh, my God, you know, what's that? That also lets Janet hear. OK, that's where the trouble is. But she flies up to Scott and right to his face. And I love the look where where she's so small. So his eyes are crossed to try to see him like right at his nose. And yep. again, he's already probably having a little bit of hallucination and stuff. And then he sees this flying little lady and he's like, I don't know. My head's going wild. But she ends up giving him a little kiss. So you, nice. get that little, you get that little heart on there. <laughs> yes. it's, it's like a really, it's a, it's a Tinkerbell moment. It is. It's so, very Tinkerbell. And he's like, oh, I need to reassess my life because maybe I'm going crazy. <laughs> and he says he's going to go back to Florida. That works perfectly for me. Yeah, and, and I like it because what Ewing, the four parts of this series are supposed to each address a different mm-hmm. time period of Ant-Man's career. And so just in the first issue, even though it's very Silver Age and it's got that whole vibe and tone, and you're dealing with those very silver age e characters you you're setting up the future exactly but not doing that not doing it in a ham fisted way i mean you you could say this second story uh robbery by scott lang is a little 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 coincidental it is coincidental and it, it's it may be eye rolling out. if he didn't do what he did with it because with that you end up that little kiss that little deal then you're like okay how can i bash something that's got the tinkerbell moment and i think you're right with this whole play is it's very fun It's very wink, wink. It's very Silver Age. But you're still actually getting a story. This isn't like sometimes these sort of things. I mean, I can even look at the thing book that Tom Riley just did end up finishing, which was who knows what that book was going. But even this, you may may get overwhelmed with the, okay, I'm going to do this little joke and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. Look at us. We're Silver Age. There's actually a story going on as well. And Mm. in the book itself, that's, like you said, a little coincidence, a little eye rolling. But I like the idea that the villains, they're goofy, right? We've we've established this, but they don't think they are. They are taking this seriously. And they're not, it's not like one of those, hey, we're back, the crazy guys from the past. And we're going to show everybody how, no, no, they're doing their thing. And it feels like, it it doesn't feel as much as a, Hey, look at us. We're going to ape that time. It feels like, oh, this feels like really you grabbed it out of there and put it out like we said at the beginning. And that's what I think the big thing is. It's goofy, but it's actually taking itself seriously in that goofiness. And when you get the Tinkerbell moment, I like I, it. Right. That's smile. what we mentioned. In the mu- It's cute. It's cute in that the, the quaintness of the, the Silver Age tone of the entire story. But the, the story is played with 100 percent sincerity. Nobody there, there's no wink, wink, nudge, nudge at the camera. There's no. Oh, we're doing this thing because, and it's silly, but we know it's silly, so we're just we're not taking it seriously. Everybody takes it seriously. I mean, in a, in, in a slightly modified circumstance, Trego, who has got the this hypnotic trumpet, I mean that is, that is, that's not too far off from somebody like a Count Vertigo, who is a serious threat for somebody like Batman. So that, you know, there, there's potential here if you know, given a little bit more you know f- finesse and finagling to kind of get guys to to level up a little bit. Yeah, and I think that the big thing that the jokes and everything and the whole concept, it's laughing with it, not at it. It's laughing yep, yep. along with the Silver Age play and using these little tropes and things in a story that does make sense for Hank. It's not like oh, remember how awful these were and how goofy, but you still get the smiles and the laughs of that goofy era because it was goofy but in my mind and this is the thing right we just to say i love silver age comics and i never take them as that goofy like that i like the idea that they're having fun now there's other examples like some people went out of their way and it got really wonky but in my mind it was the fun and like you said the wholesomeness of it I'd rather have that than say, you know, some sort of Tom King, you know, having Adam Strange be a genocidal maniac. Like that's, I like this more. Right. This is before deconstruction was a thing. So I I do like that. But we're almost done the deal because as they're doing this, you end up having Janet go in and she starts kicking butt. I mean, she really is. That karate kick that she gives Trucko is awesome. Like right Right to to the the face. It's so good. And it's a pow right in the kiss room moment. It's so good. It is. And so with this, all the villains start trying to yep. use all their weird tech. And you have the window washer. He's spraying his spray and trying to get you. And she says that it, it kind of got on the outer edges of it. So she is slowing down. But, yep. but that's when we get the big, you know, let me make you old, Ray, uh, which really is fun. And he ends up where the Time Master ends up spraying. You know, Hank, but Hank actually, and it's funny too, because Hank has figured out 
And the way that he goes, he's like, I figured out that if I get old, I get real skinny. Okay. I guess you would. Yeah, but maybe. Maybe. It's more that they didn't figure that out when he, they go to do it. But yeah, you have old man fight now, which again, that made me laugh. I actually smiled with it. Uh, but uh, Hank's but- right. An 80 year old Hank Pym is going to be able to knock the block off of an 80 year old time master who's actually old and, and whatnot. So. I thought that was pretty fun. So it turns out if Hank Payne gets older in real time or gets older artificially, he's still going to smack you across the kisser if you get <laughs> out of line. He doesn't. It, well, there you go. Well, the problem is, and where he'll get away with it here, is he's now 80 years old, even if it's faking a bail. Well, you know, it's of the time. <laughs> That's what men <laughs> used to do to each other. It's when he gets back to being a regular age guy and starts being handsy with everyone that people got upset. But he's there with this old Ray. And then uses a little, and I again, he uses a little go green deal of how a plastic bottle takes so long to degrade. But it wasn't, yep. it, it was kind of, it made me laugh. No, but, but between this, but between how he got out of the restraints by allowing himself to be Asian, not that he had a choice because it was chained up, and by destroying the the uh, the, the window washer's bottle. Again, it, it, this is one of those circumstances where Hank Penn is just a consummate scientist. He's always looking for clever ways to get out of things. And he uses his brains rather than his fists to kind of work most of this out. And it's funny because he does that. Janet comes in full out karate kicks. So that's a cool little back and forth with it. And this is also the first time, or, or maybe it was revealed, but you know, I have to go back to the really old issues and that, that, that made decent research. But where, apparently that Ray is, gives you something called artificial aging, which is, I don't know how to tell you, I don't know how you tell the difference between artificial <laughs> aging and real either. aging. I have no idea. <laughs> but no, okay, it's funny. sure, we'll go with it. And it's funny because you end up having it that, it, when we get to it, but the funny thing about this is, is that he ends up doing and, and it would be one of those examples if this was a real one from back in the day where you'd have somebody like, oh, I used to like comics before they ended up going green or talking about, you know, the environment or things. And I'm telling you, it's like that little subtle wink, wink of, oh, he has a plastic bottle. They will degrade, but it takes hundreds of years and then he zaps it and it does end up having the paralytic fluid go over the window washer. But that's when he does what the classic classic trope if you have an age ray there's got to be a button that you just reverse <laughs> and exactly yourself. that's all he does he reverses the polarity and then like you said explains well artificial age you can reverse and you can go back like i don't know how that works but i like it this entire last scene is where you just go with it that's yeah. what that's one of yeah. those just yeah. go with it yeah, yeah. and in my mind too if i'm hank if it was possible but that's where that artificial aging i'm like yeah, i think i'll knock 10 years off myself as well and get going redo those but he ends up getting back to normal as you pretty much have Janet in the back just, you know, faithfully holding the helmet for him. Like, Janet, don't be too nice to him. I, that's all I can think. Anything with her and Janet, with Janet and him on the on the page, I'm like, please stop. It's going to be bad. Uh, but, yeah, you end up where he's taken down these guys. But the leader, the protector, he tries to, to run off. He's running to the fire escape. And actually jumps down. I, I don't know how he survives this jump. I mean, a second floor, I guess you can. But he's an old guy as well. But he thinks he's safe at last. And then you get like the classic ending of a adventure fight with Ant-Man. He's on his shoulder. He gets big and wallops him and sends him flying into the air. I'm like, holy crap, he hit him. But this is the, but this is this is again foreshadowing the, yeah. the future of Hank Pym because he he doesn't just and dig in and knock him out. He says, I've been with you the whole time. I wanted you to, to know that no matter where you run, I'm going to be following you. You just can't get away. So he's already using intimidation tactics on guys uh, to make sure that they never forget that, uh, you know, Hank Pym is not somebody you want to mess with in the future. He's got uh, a dark sure. edge. I'll tell you yeah, that. Yeah, he definitely and, does. Uh, and I do like the idea. I mean, there you go. Even back in the day, you know, before it got really bad with that. And, and again, that's because they ended up using that whole deal of his anger and stuff like that and goes to the next level, took it a little too far. But I do like even uh, Stan Lee said that he loved him and he thought he was a great character because, yeah, it's not just, hey, he gets real little and he does things. He does have an edge to him. He is able to wallop guys when he has to and things like that. So and a very smart guy who uses the tactics and the smarts in a fight. So I do like that as well. But they take these guys away. And you end up where Hank's just hanging with Janet. They're there. It was pretty much a failed date, as always. And check out Trago's face. She, he was the one that got wild. He's got a shine on him. They're all beat up. Uh, but they're there. One thing with that, though, I will go back to Janet when they she's there sitting at the theater. 
uh, time's going. She even made the joke, would he fall in the toilet? But maybe he did because he's Ant-Man. But at one point that Eric had to have run back in. He was running back in. Maybe he ran out the ba- the door, but it looked like he was running back yelling, oh, my God, ants, ants, ants. Like all these things should have shown or told Janet that there is problems going on. But she just kept watching the movie and then got the signal. Halep. I'm glad I'm with you. I really thought, oh, thank God it wasn't like Halep. I had a cousin Halep once and he didn't. I'm like, no, no, don't do that. But you end up where we're going to go and have our little connection to the continuing series here where it ends and you do see that scientist there and you see Hank, oh my God, it's you. What's going on? You know, you said I did a great service to humanity. What did you mean? And he says, and then again, you want to go Hank? Hank fists a fly in here, says, answer me, bless you, and gets really angry. And this guy says, the answer's below, you know, Dr. Pym, it's under your feet. And you look, and it looks like maybe, a, you know, a teleportation type deal or whatever. He's seeing into another dimension. Because yeah, some then, kind of portal. Yeah. And then you get this last deal where he's looking. And, yeah, you have a really cool last page where, or last two pages, actually, where you have Hank looking. He's going down. There's the other villains and heroes, Ant-Man, all this going to where he gets to what looks like that facility that we saw in the beginning. And then you see this guy full out masked. And I thought it looked cool. The, uh, you know, and he says, I'm the Ant-Man. And that's yeah, he's the, he's the future Ant-Man from yeah. 500 years in the future. And yeah, it's very futuristic. It's sort of Tron-like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Would, would, Power would Rangers, maybe? Yeah, I mean, Power Rangers. It yeah. does look like that. I'm not a fan of Tron. I'm like the only one who saw Tron originally and got bored out of my gourd. And then actually at that point, my buddy... He loved it. It's one of his favorite movies of all time. And, and yeah. we get in fights, and I'm like, I didn't like that. He's like, that was the best thing ever. Well, I think that, I think there's a certain nostalgia built on novelty because it, it was so, I mean, there was nothing like it at the no, time. No, it wasn't. And, and so if you were there, you're just sort of like, wow, this is really cool. I think that's the part that sticks with you. Yeah, if you watch it today, it looks like very dated. It's sort of like watching uh, uh, The Last Starfighter. If you see, I do love that movie, but the space scenes really could do for an update because the the, the, the graphics are so outdated. And uh, But yeah, I mean, I love the suit. I like the way it looks. I like the way it presents. The, the face mask in particular looks very ant-like, more so than Hank Pym. And and you, you kind of say, okay, all right, so there's there's basically a legacy of ant men, if mm-hmm. you want to say it that way, that is that's lasting for centuries, and this is this is one slice of some bigger adventure, and, yeah. and it kind of get it kind of gets you ramped up to say, okay, what's the next one? Yep. Are, are you going to tackle the next one just as well? Now you already mentioned that the next one is going into uh, Eric, yeah, which is weird. I I thought that we would just go to Scott, and it says that Eric is in this in this deal at the end and i really like the end and everything in this even that page class classic look uh with the ants all around but yeah you have that going and it says that they're gonna have eric and he's got to find scott but scott's dead and we'll, we'll see what all of that is and what's going on and if you didn't know the all uh, eric o'grady the irredeemable ant-man was a robert kirkman book that he had that only lasted 12 issues it lasted 12 issues and the last issue was funny it was, it. it was not a big hit no it was not and then it was canceled they never it's the funny thing it wasn't announced to be canceled but in the 12th issue basically it was all about eric being pissed off that the book was canceled <laughs> and it's so wacky and then that was one of the things actually that robert kirkman said really convinced him finally like i gotta do my own thing the, the, i got I, everything gets you know, pulled and tug of war and stuff with a big company. So he ended up kind of getting out of the deal and, you know, doing some little things like Walking Dead and stuff, which was already going. So, yeah, just some little things by by turning image into a behemoth. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, coming out with a black and white book that nobody could think would ever survive and ends up being one of the biggest pop culture properties uh, that we've had. So and also when nothing, you mentioned nothing important, when you yeah, mentioned Last important. Starfighter, it was funny because I almost ended up saying, Time Bandits, which was another movie around that time that I love. I love. And then it got me sad because I realized that David Warner was in both of those and he died this week. And I'm like, oh, yeah, oh he, my. Just, he, he did just die. Didn't yeah, oh, yeah, it sucks. So Time Bandits is a, a movie that I think people have forgotten about. Like Tron, you can mention and people know Time Bandits is so good. I love so that So good movie. and so meta. There's yeah, so is. many, there's so many clever messages in like satirical pokes at that. what's going on in society. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's, it is very British. It is, but yep. I like yep. that. And it's funny because my big 
movie things were Star Wars, New Hope, then mm-hmm. Indiana Jones and Return, uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Star. You know, the yep. and then the next one was the next big thing of me going and watching and whatnot as a real little kid was Time Bandits, and I love that movie. And I've probably seen Time Bandits as much as I've seen any other movie. I watched it constantly. It was on HBO then back in the day, oh, yeah. and I would watch it constantly. I loved it so much. And then I went back. It is a little dated, but I do think people should go and watch that. Time Band, this is for you, for me. Probably the movie that fits right in there, it would be um, Flash Gordon. Okay, and that, I, I, I love that, too. It's, it is so, I mean, the, the costumes are bad. The sets are, are oh, bad. Oh, it's so but, cheesy. Queen, though, awesome. But the Queen soundtrack is unbeatable, and they play it with, again, here's that word again. They play it with such sincerity. Everybody's going, giving a hundred percent all to make it the best they can, even though it doesn't turn out that way. But you just, you just can't help but love those, especially with Brian Blessed as as uh, Zoltan, the yep. you know the king of the, the awesome. Hawkman. Uh, He's I, mean, the I, love, I love that movie. But here we are, Ant Man. I got a little off trail, uh, but yeah, I really like this. Yeah, I like that. A little suggestions for people. I said, you know, this. I wanted to start this Wednesday midweek deal. Of, you know, focusing on one or two of the comics that came out, give people a chance to read the rest of them because they just come out today, uh, but also have a little fun and talk other things, have a little goofiness. So and check, check and check. This was an unexpectedly pleasant surprise. I didn't know what to expect going in, but I, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And you're talking about talking with me, I'm sure. Not the comic, right? A gem oh, the comic you are, second Gabe. You are, you're a gem of a man. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I really like this comic a lot. Yes. I know my priorities. <laughs> I really like this. I actually was. There's a lot of uh, roadblocks for this for me. Uh, number one, Al and Ewing, because I really, I really tend to, you know, worry because a lot of the things that I read, like you said, the Guardians of the Galaxy. I, I know that Ruben liked it. I thought it was unreadable. I could not keep up with it. It was boring, and, and this is far from that. And then I saw Tom Riley. I'm like. Where do I know that name? Then I saw the art. I'm like, oh, that thing. Not that he had anything to do with the script, but this really fits. I mean, this is like everything fit for this. The only thing I worry about is, is it going to keep that same cuteness? Is it going to keep that same vibe going to the different Ant-Men? We'll have to see. We'll have to see how they play it. But I think that this Silver Age, Hank, you know, Janet deal was perfect. I thought it was a great start with it. And I will point out something that Al Ewing doesn't usually do because he usually likes to take his good old time this ends up where at the beginning you play along and have that little hey we can't reveal this because that would be a spoiler but by the end the last page cliffhanger we find out we find out that this is the future ant-man we don't know why he's collecting the ant-men or the ants but at least we have that it doesn't end up that mystery is somewhat solved but leads to more mystery so okay now we know it's the ant-man looks cool what's it all about let's go uh, what would you give it? I would. I, I don't remember what the score I put on this, but I think I gave this a nine. Yep, I think I like this a, a lot. Yeah. So this this was this was an unexpected treat, and you're exactly right. They they established like a confusing kind of a, a you know a unclear question in the beginning, but by the end they solve it. But they solve it just enough that you feel satisfied, but that gives you uh, uh keeps you hanging on for more. Somebody should tell Al Ewing to go talk to Zeb Wells with that amazing Spider Man run. So. <laughs> because that's exactly Donny that's Cates exactly what's, a lot of things now like uh, that Hulk deal. I mean, it is true. Yeah, that's exactly what Zeb was doing with the Spider Man, and that he did that, that he was supposed to do that he didn't do, and especially after a full six issue arc. So yeah, I don't mean to get off on Spider Man, but this is exactly how you're supposed to handle it. You introduce a question and then answer it at least enough to be satisfied, and that's exactly what he did here. Yeah, and I I would say, and I'm giving it a nine as well, just like you did on the site. And in that, I I like some things in it it does feel like an older comic before deconstruction and stuff like that or writing from the trade because the idea where if you like this but for some reason you didn't have any money or you're like yeah you know i i just like hank you can read this as a one shot little deal yeah you're not going to know exactly who or what goes on but it is a full hank story here you get a reveal at the end hey i'm the ant man of the future, boom, you could just stop here and you're like, yep, I, I got enough. It, it was fulfilling of that one thing. Hopefully, though, you like it enough to continue. But yeah, I, I think that that's a good kickoff for the week because, yeah, it was pretty good. This is one of the fewer uh, comics that I'm reading from the big two that I'm like, oh my God, I got another thing I'm excited for. And it does usually with Marvel at one point end up being these miniseries that I'm liking, like the Peter David stuff and things like that that I've really been enjoying. 
And at least then you know there's a beginning and an end. This is four issues. Let's get it tight. Let's do it. So I'm looking forward to the next one. But with that, that's uh, it for you, Gabe. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> thank, oh, you thanks, jo- thank you for joining me, though, Gabe. And we'll be figuring out what we'll do each week. And you'll hopefully you'll want to join me each week. And we'll talk about some of the books. But again, go to our site to definitely check out Gabe's reviews there. But Gabe, tell everybody where else they can go because Gabe has other things that he does. I do have other things. Obviously, go to Weird Science uh, Marvel Comics uh, on Twitter. Follow when we follow back. Also, at the same time, I'm, I'm publisher in EIC of ComicalOpinions.com. You can follow us at, at, at Comical Opinions. So if you want to cover anything uh, or you want to read reviews on any comics that are outside the big two, uh, uh, Zenoscope, Mad Cave, Source Point, Dynamite, all those other comics, uh, go there and you're going to have a good time. You're going to see a lot of reviews and we cover a lot of stuff. So uh, happy to be contributors to both. And uh, thank you for having me on the show. Yep, Yeah. So everybody go check it out in the show notes. I'll put all the links to Gabe's stuff. Check those out. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. I promise I'll get Gabe's audio a bit better. But before you leave and before I leave, let me remind you, go over to Twitter at WS Marvel Comics. Follow us. We'll follow you back. Then go to our website, weirdsciencemarvelcomics.com. Check us out over there. Pretty cool, right? And then also go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash weirdscience, where you can help support us for everything we do on this feed. I'm trying to put a bunch of shows on the feed, some different people doing some stuff with me, and even the X-Men stuff that's Jason and Chris. I am not even involved in that. But I try to give a pretty complete deal On the regular feed, but if you go over to the Patreon, you get even more. You end up getting pretty much bonus material there, including each week we do a two-issue spotlight. We do a Patreon-only spotlight with books picked by the badasses of the Get Fresh crew. And that's the top two levels of the Patreon they get to pick from that week's books to have what we you know, focus on for a unique spotlight episode that comes out on Thursday night. And it looks like this week, what we'll be talking about there is Iron Cat number two and Captain America symbol of truth number three, which leaves three books that we'll be talking about on the main podcast. And that's to remind everybody, the main Marvel show will come out on Sunday night now. And on that show, we'll be talking about the amazing Spider-Man number six, which is legacy 900 strange number four, and Venom number nine. So three bangers right there. Me and Jason will be talking about. And remember again, and I'll put it in the show notes, the uh, podcast schedule. Tuesdays is the X-Men show. Wednesdays into Thursday morning probably will be this midweek show. That, again, will feature one or two books and maybe some news and things like that. A little bit more loosey-goosey there. Friday night will now be when we have the Star Wars podcast. And then on Sunday night, we will have the main show. As a little bit of an aside, another reason to maybe push everybody over to the Patreon, I will probably end up having the main show that comes out Sunday now. You will have early access as early as Thursday night for that. So if you want to listen, same old schedule, same old, same old, you'll be able to go to the Patreon and actually sign up for as little as a dollar, and you can listen to that main show a bunch of days in advance. So there's a little bit of an incentive to go over there. And I hope that it's something that you might want to do. Check out some of the shows that we do over there because you like what we do here. And maybe even listen to the DC Comics podcast that I do with Eric or also the manga stuff that I do with my men, Luke Hollywood. And if you don't know about that, you could just look up Weird Science DC Comics or Weird Science Manga and you'll find those podcasts and check it out. I think that there's some stuff for everybody to enjoy on all the things that we do. But that's it. Again, thank you, Gabe. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hope you'll start to enjoy, again, a little more coverage, a little more spacing of these episodes. And that's that. So I will talk to you all later. You are all weirdos. Weird science is the revolution. 